So which parts of the brain are uh, uh, implicated in ME? Um, this is quite a challenging question because there have been quite a large number of different brain regions associated with ME um, on brain imaging studies. So one of the most uh, common findings or the most reported finding is quite widespread changes in white matter. And these, this is the part of the brain that connects different brain regions. There have been also a number of other studies looking, for example, at the role of the basal ganglia, in particular the ventral striatum. And Andrew Miller, a scientist working in Atlanta, has suggested that the, the, the ventral striatum or the basal ganglia respond differently to rewards in people who have ME. So there are quite a large number of different brain regions that have been associated with ME. However, I would say that, that, that there need to be a lot more studies done to really try and identify whether any of these are, are common across individuals with, with ME. So how do the brain and the immune system communicate? And, uh, and this is a very interesting and also um, quite, a, quite a difficult question to answer, mainly because there are a number of quite different ways that the immune system and brain communicate. One of the perhaps the most important ways is the autonomic nervous system. So these are the nerves that communicate between the brain and the, the internal organs. They're responsible for controlling heart rate, controlling some degree of, of, of control of our, our intestines, our, our gut, but also they respond to changes within those organs. So our brain can sense when these different organs change in their function. And they're also very sensitive to inflammation. So if our bodies become inflamed, the autonomic nerves sense this and can communicate this directly to the brain. There are a number of other ways also that the immune system can communicate with the brain. One is that these proteins produced by the immune system can act directly on the brain, in particular regions of the brain. They can also change the, the vasculature, so the blood vessels within the brain, resulting in an inflammatory response within the brain itself. This is, this is a very interesting question. How do the, the gastrointestinal tract and the brain communicate? Now, even though this isn't work that I've personally been doing, there are a number of groups around the world with a very active interest in how, how the, the gut communicates with the brain. And in particular, how what's called the microbiome, so the millions and billions of bacteria that we all have within our guts, how that impacts on human function and behavior. And there have been a lot of very interesting studies beginning to, to, to emerge that would suggest that the, the bacteria within our guts can change a number of things, including our propensity to put on weight, to be overweight, as well as numerous other aspects of human behavior. So this is a rapidly emerging field um, that I think we'll see some very exciting new developments in, in, in the coming years. So this is an interesting concept, um, and it really addresses the question of how we believe the brain may function. So there are a number of prominent theories that suggest that the brain is a predictive machine. It predicts what it expects to happen in the world and compares that to what is happening in the world. And a simple example of this could be catching a ball. We, in real time, we place our hand in space where we think it needs to be, and our brain gets feedback from the hand to say where it truly is in space. And this needs to happen, if you like, in real time. In order to catch a ball, we need to be able to compare where we expect our hand to be with the feedback from where the hand actually is. And similar ideas have been applied to, for example, the relationship between inflammation and fatigue. Our brain predicts a certain amount of inflammation within our body, and then compares that to the signal that is coming in. And if there's a mismatch between those two signals, that could be perceived um, as fatigue. So these are um, some, some ideas that we're currently looking at to see whether those individuals that experience the most fatigue or, or even chronic fatigue have a big mismatch between absolute levels and 
levels predicted within the brain. Again, this is an important question. What of all of the evidence out there do I think is, is most supportive of ME um, not being a psychic or a psychological um, condition? And I think for me that some of the most compelling data comes from a group from Andrew Lloyd in Australia. They've done really beautiful work looking at what happens to otherwise healthy individuals after they get an infection. And they've done this in hundreds of different patients and they've been able to capture them pretty much as soon as they develop an infection and then follow them up for six months to a year. And what these, uh, this group has shown is that firstly, in otherwise previously healthy individuals, about 20% of them after an infection with things like Epstein-Barr and also rarer infections like Ross River virus, develop chronic disabling fatigue and that's associated with cognitive impairments, chronic headaches, and in many cases also ongoing muscle aches. So I think this is really exciting and important data that suggests even in a previously healthy a group of individuals, about 20% of them will develop chronic fatigue or ME-like symptoms six months after having one of a number of different infections. So I think this is really powerful evidence that that a wide range of different infections can induce chronic fatigue um, and cognitive symptoms.